Hey everybody, thanks again for joining me this week. Today we're going to be talking about world building. And this is a topic that's going to be applicable whether you're in game design, if you're an artist, if you're a writer, you know, or kind of, you know, any kind of production role in games and, and even just, you know, as an author writing books or movies or creating any kind of interactive content or, or linear content or anything, um, this topic is really kind of applicable to all that. This is not going to be a game specific topic. This is really about how to build worlds. And again, whether you're writing them, whether you're creating this for a novel or whether you're creating this, you know, for a game or a movie or anything else, um, it's all um, applicable today. And um, I want you guys to kind of see, you know, that some of this will be a little game specific. Um, I understand the gameplay related to world building, but a lot of this is going to be very applicable no matter what your job or, or role is. So first of all, um, you know, hey Rushback, good to see you again. Oscar, Cassie, Who's Bounty, um, everybody welcome. You know, and thanks again to all my regulars who, who are joining and, and anybody new, you know. Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of start with just to give you guys a little bit of an overview of kind of where I'm thinking about going and, I, and I'd love any feedback. Um, if you guys have topics that you want to talk about or anything, um, please let me know. This is... Um, if you don't know, week 23 of my um, of my live streams. So that's um, this will be 46 hours of content that are available um, in the YouTube channel just under uh, what I'm teaching. And so there's a huge amount of content. Um, a lot of it's pretty good. Some of it sucks, but you know it's it, there's a lot there. Um, and um, I hopefully you guys are getting a lot out of it. But I also you know want to make sure I'm talking about subjects that are relevant to you guys. And so um, the um, so part of what I'm going to be doing the next couple weeks is kind of working towards um, trying to do a real world example of how to design a game. And so so this week we're going to do some introductions to world building. Um, next week we're probably going to talk about how to integrate gameplay in world building and really how to, to kind of go back and forth between world building and gameplay to really make a game better and to kind of how to understand how to balance the needs of a world versus the needs of gameplay. And those are, that's a topic that's tricky and hard to do. Um, and then I'm going to attempt to do a class on storytelling and kind of the related, because this is also related to, to world building, right? This is very much about storytelling and what and what we're doing here. And so I'm going to do um, a talk on kind of interactive storytelling and, and storytelling in general at all levels from writing high level stories all the way down to specific dialogue, you know, and everything in between from quests and, and that stuff and how that interrelates to how do you tell stories in your world building, right? So there, all, all of these are kind of interrelated. And then, um, hi, Megan, nice to see you. And, um, and so... So we're going to be doing a lot over the next few weeks about world building and trying to really show you hopefully how to put it together. And then um, my plan is probably starting the first of the new year, I'm going to um, actually probably sit down. I'm trying to figure out exactly how to do it, but to actually just sit down and design something, and, you know, and literally just go from me having a really basic idea, like I'm going to build a sci-fi game and not know anything else, even myself and literally talk through and literally like probably open up a word document and um and literally just sit and design with you guys and show you how i do it and show you how to really do it and, and put it down in, in such a way that you you kind of understand how to take the theory of these things that we'll be talking about the next few weeks or the theory if you're one of my students about the, the stuff we're learning in class and then how do you really you know implement that and i think that's something that even i'm a little bit bad in my classes that i didn't necessarily cover as deep or as thoroughly as I probably should have. And so I want to try to start to really kind of make the rubber where the road is, so to speak, and, and really show you guys how to implement these things. So so I want you to kind of understand that process we're going to go through um, over this next month and then and then for the, the probably month or two after that of really trying to do my best to show you guys how to design something, you know, and literally let's do it together and stuff because I think there's still a lot of breakdowns about like, hey, I've got all this theory, I've got all this knowledge, but um, but then you know when it actually comes time to implement it, I think a lot of people still get confused and it still gets a lot harder. It seems really easy in theory when you start to jump into an idea and then you think like, oh, that's not so hard. Like I, I just kind of I got to come up with a game idea, right? 
And it's amazing um, how many people struggle with that where it seems like, oh, an idea should be really simple. But when you actually start trying to implement it, um, a, a vast majority of people are failing um, because it's a lot harder than you realize when you actually have to kind of really make something work and make it fun um, and make it interesting and exciting and stuff. And so that's a, a huge challenge that I'll try to, to walk through. Now, sorry. The, um, so, so part of um, what I want to also do, you know, in this series here of, of what we're going to kind of be building around world building and, and game design um, is to try to show you, it, so in the perfect world, this is not always, this is not always the case, but in the, in the perfect world, um, if we have the time, if we have the ability, when we're designing worlds, when we're designing things, um, we want to try to design a, a franchise. And I'll get more into this in a, in a minute, but but we want to build something that's not just for a game, right? A game or a movie or, or a TV show or whatever is really a product, right? It's a single thing. It's a single entity that we're designing for. And, and that's not a world. A, a world is a universe. A world is something much bigger. And so, so today when we're talking about world building and in the weeks to come, we're going to talk about kind of this idealized ability for us to be able to um, design outside the vacuum of the, the dependency on a single product. So what does that mean, right? So a lot of times when we're making decisions about something, about how much we flesh it out, about how much detail we put into it, we're, we're designing it in the context of, you know, that one game, right? So we might have, let's just say, you know, um, we're doing a science fiction game or we're doing something like Star Wars. You know, and we might only we might only initially in this first game, we might only go and be building a first person shooter on one planet, for example. Right. And um, hey, Jonathan, good to see you. And um, we might be building just a an FPS on on one planet in the Star Wars universe. Right. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the, the universe doesn't exist. And even even that one planet, we may be only seeing that one segment, that one thing that that design, you know, that's designed for that particular, you know, set of missions and quests and the story that we're in. That we may be in one city, we might be in one part of that universe, right? But we're only seeing the small corner of the universe. And so, in some cases, you know, and, and realistically, when we get when we get the job of designing things, you, again, whether they are you know a, a game or movie or whatever we're designing. We don't necessarily always have the time to de to design the whole universe, right? So, but what we need to do is like we know that something here has to be really um, perfectly fleshed out because this is what our product is. But we know that the universe is much bigger, right? And so, what I want to teach you how to do is how to work in and build this this thing. But at the same hand, you build these tentacles, you build these things out to the rest of the universe to really build um, these hooks. That allow you to build something bigger and understanding what those things are and understanding what's important and why it's important and how we make decisions of building a franchise and how we build you know a world and a universe is a much different set of problems than if we're building that little corner that little you know that one product that we're that we are currently trying to build right and so but you have to be aware that we can easily go down the proverbial rabbit holes, right? We can very easily go spend a lot of time as a game designer writing stories and building out characters and building out all these things out here that, that aren't part of our product. And then that could take us weeks and months and years to do when we don't need it yet, right? And so, so knowing how much to design, knowing when to design it is really one of your biggest keys to success in this. And so, so I really, really, really want to temper this today in this entire conversation about world building that that I'm talking about this in, an, in a kind of in a production world in an idealized fashion, right? We're talking about this in a perfect world and I'm not saying that we always get or, or ever get the chance to do this in a real production world because somebody may come in and say like, hey, you've got six weeks to do this, you know, and that does not necessarily mean that you're going to have the time to build out the universe and build out the world. But if you understand the concepts, if you understand conceptually about world building, you can put little tentacles in. You can put little examples of things that might eventually turn into something else. Um, so let me give you an example of like a hook that you could put into. So if you've watched The Walking Dead or a show like that, 
Um, I like the, the, like, if you look at the very first Walking Dead series, it, it took place, um, you know, I believe in the Atlanta area, you know, kind of southeastern United States. And most of the show took place with the knowledge of what those characters, the world they were in. They, they, they had their own knowledge. They had the, the, their experiences of what happened to them when the zombie apocalypse happened. And you, and you over time are getting little bits of pieces of each of those characters. And, and as they move through the world, you're getting a little bit more understanding of that world, but they kind of still stayed like initially, you know, in that world. And that was kind of all they got. But then occasionally a character comes in from outside the world, right? And that character brings knowledge. That character brings information. And that character may tell them like, hey, in Europe, you know, the, the zombie apocalypse wasn't bad, for example. Maybe they held it off. And, you know, and so, you know, like London might have been isolated or the UK might have caught it and they isolated themselves. And so they didn't have an outbreak. And so they're still functioning, you know, and so you learn about this world. But all you had was maybe one or two lines of dialogue. You didn't have... This whole fleshed out like, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of like what happened in Europe and what happened in UK and how that happened. But just knowing that like UK was okay or something there happened suddenly gives you a whole different perspective on the whole zombie apocalypse, right? And so, um, the, um, <laughs> big lob of goo is, <laughs> yes. God, this, hopefully this will help you a lot on your, on your, your class this week and in, in week 12 you're on. So, um, so thanks, Megan. Um, so when you're world building, you know, what you're doing is, is, is often just sort of understanding deep in your heart, understanding your knowledge that you can put in these little things, you can put in these little teasers, right? It doesn't have to be again, that there's this whole thing out here. So in your mind, you might pencil in this black box, right? You know, like, okay, up here is England, over here is something else, over here is something else. Like this could be in the Star Wars universe, you know, um, Tatooine and, you know, Hoth and, and these different planets, right? You know, those exist. And you might know that that, you know, is a ice planet and the desert planet. And, you know, this is where you know, the bounty hunters live, or this is where this race is from. And you might know a couple details, but you don't have to go into and, and like flesh out the entire world history for that planet, right? But by knowing that thing exists, by knowing that that's there, um, at some point later in time, you can come back to it. But but by making it interesting, by, by doing something kind of fun with it, you can, um, it gives you these little tentacles, these little hooks of stuff that you can introduce like a new character that's kind of interesting. You can introduce you know, the, the, the thought that maybe something else is out there, the thought that maybe the world is bigger, right? So a lot of what we're doing is we're inspiring players, we're inspiring our viewers, our readers, whoever this is, we're inspiring them to know more. We're, we're inspiring them to use their creativity, to, to, to use their own imaginations, right? So we, we hint that there's something else out there, but then we don't have to define it clearly, but in their own minds, they're often like, Oh, I want to know more. And, and ultimately that can allow us to have, you know, sequels or have other games or have other stories or quests or things go into that world later on. Right. And so, so, so keep in mind that you don't have to flesh out your world building in a, in a massive context. You don't have to, to flesh it out, you know, every little tiny detail. And if you do go down those rabbit holes, you can get in trouble. So you have to figure out what does your game need, right? What, what do you need? You know, what do you want to do to make this seem interesting, to make it seem special? And then again, you know, if you, if you watch my systemic game design talk, in the same way, you can have lots of categories, right? You might have a, a list of planets and then a subcategory of here's my six planets, right? And then under those, you might have a, a, a little template that you're going to create like what's the environment you know what's the the who lives there what's the race of people this could be inhabited by humans or this could be inhabited by dinosaurs or whatever it is but you know roughly what that thing is right and you know that it's existing and for now that may be all you need is one two three bullet points you know on a topic right so you don't have to go into these things um in like super uber detail right and so just be careful and control yourself because our natural tendency, you know, often will be to to um, deep dive into these each one of these things and, and spend weeks and months and years de defining things that we don't need to know yet. But um, in the same hand, 
if we spend a lot of time not doing this, so the danger is that if we don't world build, right? If we just build our game, if we just build our product, right? And if we only define that one thing, then what happens if later we want to do a sequel to our game? What happens if later we want to do a movie based on our game or write a book based on our game or whatever? Is our universe big enough? Is our universe interesting enough, cool enough and different enough to support that? Right. And so what will often happen is we'll lob, lob off these abilities because we'll, we'll put these hard things in there like, oh, you know, we might say this is the only planet in the universe, for example. Right. And then later on, you're like, oh, wait, I wanted to have more planets. And, and you know, now do I do I have this contrived thing that I have to do in a sequel that um, has to make up for the fact that I I told them there was no other planets. Now I want to put in some extra planets. And, and so now, like, how do I explain that, right? How do I justify that? And so if you didn't do the world building initially and have the concept that there was multiple planets, you could get yourself in trouble. Another, probably the more common problem of this are things like, I, personally, I, I call it the Highlander Syndrome. And, and there's not really a, a name for this, but it's, a, it's an example. And I don't know how many of you have seen the, the original movie called Highlander. And... Um, as a kid, that was one of my one of my favorite movies. I, I love this concept of these immortal beings that were fighting for control to kind of become the one, and the kind of and they were fighting. You know, they were they're immortals, and um, they would they would fight you know each other to try to basically become the last one alive. And so, of all these immortals that were scattered around the world, they were all fighting to become the one. And in the end of the original Highlander movie, um, Christopher Lambert, I believe was his name, was the the star of that movie. He wins the thing, and he gets the ultimate, the ultimate energy and the ultimate you know, power, and and the storyline um, completes. And he, you know, and he doesn't. Um, and there, there's no room for a sequel, really. Well, the movie was successful, and the movie had you know um, a lot of interest to make sequels, and so they got kind of stuck in that they had to sort of suddenly now they went to do a sequel. And there really wasn't room for a sequel because he won. Everybody else was dead. And, and you're like, how do you go do a sequel based on that? So when you see some of the sequels, and I can't remember how many of them ma they made, but there, there was a number of Highlander movies, um, they, they kind of sucked, right? The, 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 if you saw Highlanders 2, 3, and 4, or 5,000, whatever they made, um, they tried to do some prequels, they tried to do some sequels, they tried to do some stuff. And, and they really struggled because the universe didn't support that, right? The universe and the storylines had completion in them. And ultimately, that was sort of a bad thing. And so so in our games, we often have, um, yeah, they, uh, they did do a TV show on it as well. Actually, the TV show wasn't too bad. I, I, I probably liked the TV show better than I did a lot of the sequels of the movies. But anyways, um but I'm using that as an example of a, a franchise that was decent. It wasn't great. Um, but they, they ran into trouble because they didn't think that they would ever do something else. right? They didn't think that they would do um, a sequel or something. Now, if you compare this to other things, one of the problems we have in games and movies, um, in, in a vast majority of these, and, I, and I'm... And I'm going to narrow the genre a little bit in that this is this is typically in what we call it like an action game or or anything that has combat fighting and ultimately bad guys, right? And we'll get into this in a minute about bad guys, you know, in in general. But but where you will see this problem exist a lot is that quite often in more in most stories, and I don't care whether you're you're writing a book, a TV series, a movie, a game, or anything. There's usually a bad guy, right? Or maybe there's a couple, uh, but generally there is one thing that's bad that you are trying to stop. And that's usually the jest of the storyline, you know, for some period of time. Now, it might be that you, that you, you know, in that movie or in that game, you might go after, say, one guy who's ultimately you think is the boss or you think is the main bad guy. And then ultimately you, you confront him and either kill him or not. And then you find out that, um, he maybe not is the biggest bad guy, right? So, so then you might find out who his boss is, and then you go after him, and then maybe you go after another guy. But, but generally, there's there's some resolution that at the end of that game, at the end of that TV show, or whatever, 
we we defeat something. Then what? Right? So it's kind of like Highlander. Like you 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 wrap it up because the, the bad guy is dead, right? And then what else is gonna happen in the world? And so a lot of franchises suffer from this and that they they defeat the bad guy and then there's not something else to take its place. So if the player is an action hero or an action star or doing action related stuff against the bad guy, this is quite often a problem. So some shows have, have done this kind of masterfully and I'll date myself a little bit here because it's an older show, but there was a TV show called Babylon 5. And Babylon 5 was also very similar to Star Trek um, Deep Space Nine. And they were actually both originally, if you don't know, based on the same script. Um, the original script was by J. Michael Strakinsky. Um, Joe is a friend of mine and an amazing writer. And if you don't know, when they wrote um, Babylon 5, um, he actually wrote a full five-year story arc. And so... Um, I believe each, you know, each uh, season was 20, 22 episodes back then. So he wrote, let's say, 100 episodes. And he understood, um, he understood where the story was going to go throughout those whole 100 episodes. And so he wrote this high-level arc. And so each year there was like a different kind of bad guy that would come in and a different threat to the universe and things like that. But, but he also understood that he had to foreshadow that. He couldn't, he couldn't just like kill off one bad guy easily and then just say, start season two and suddenly, ta-da, new bad guy, you know, and now there's another threat to the universe. Like, yes, you can do that, but it's not as, it's not as good. It's not as clean, right? And so when you, when you see a lot of those things, you might have tension and, and drama and things building, right? You, you have stuff um, over time where you might have like one bad guy that you're fighting, the main, the main characters, the, the heroes, the protagonists may be fighting against something really obviously, like literally directly fighting each other in a war. But there may be another group that's kind of like simmering, building, tensions are kind of building over that group, right? So for like one season, they may not be in direct conflict with each other, but they're like, something's brewing there, right? And, and then ultimately, um, that group, you know, once this other um, group is killed, so this other, you know, villain, this other race, whatever it is, gets defeated, right, in season one. And then suddenly there's this vacuum of power. And so suddenly this other group decides to, you know, to, to move into their space, right, and take over. And, and now suddenly in season two, it makes logical sense of why this new, you know, villain is there, why this new bad guy is there. So long story short, what I'm trying to show you guys is that... that they didn't necessarily have to build all that into the universe. They didn't necessarily have to design all of that 100% upfront day one. But um, but if you at least understood that these things were going to be there, if you understood that these things were going to exist in that world, um, that that would be you know a much better story, a much better world, and be much more interesting again to give them those hooks, right? So that's what good world building does. Good world building tries to, to create a, a world and a universe that goes beyond your product. It's something, again, that, that, that makes it more interesting. It makes it more believable. Um, a lot of this is story. A lot of this is background. But what I want to show you is, you know, and this is going to be over the course of a few weeks, about... How do you take these things and make that that thing that you built into the world or to the universe, how do you make that thing more interesting in the game, in the product, right, and, and stuff, so that it's not just, world building should not just be something that a writer does. A world building is something that the team does or the creative director, you know, is overseeing with, with a number of people under you. This, this is quite often a, a much bigger effort that can that can work you know that can work with a lot of different people and so even if you're an artist you might be trying to world build um, you know just a particular planet a particular city and you're working to try to understand what is that city and why is it unique and why is it cool why is it different right and and who are those people in it so part of that world building is also the visuals and we're gonna talk about that one week as well like how do you build the visual design and how do we tell story 
through visuals, right? And, and, and things like that. So world building is incredibly complicated. Like this is not an easy topic. This is not something that, that's trivial for you to try to, to get into, right? So, so I'm going to try whenever I can and try to stop and try to show you examples of how do you put this all together? How do you, how do you take world building from, you know, the most basic stuff, um, the most basic concepts and how do you really truly implement it? Because that's where it's, it's hard. And if you want great examples of world building, I would, I would look at, there is a lot of books on world building and there's even YouTube videos and stuff as well um, that go deeper than what I'm talking about. Um, but a lot of the stuff originated in writing novels and especially science fiction, fantasy type novels. And so there's a lot of books about world building out there that have to do with like sci-fi fantasy authors and how they write and create worlds. And, um, and so I do encourage you that if you want to learn more about world building, there, there is a lot of resources out there. And a lot of those are targeted towards, again, no, you know, novelists and people like that. But if you look at some of the best examples of world building, I would argue that most of those actually come from um, novels and, and stuff. Because those guys, um, the writers, your Stephen King's of the world or your Ben Boba's who just passed away... Um, People like that that, that have created these, these, especially science fiction, fantasy worlds, Tolkien, things like that, right? If you look at the depth of the world and how intricate they are, um, and if you compare that to how deep those worlds are in their movie counterparts or in their game counterparts, the books still have a significant amount of extra detail that you don't get in these other things because of just what that medium um, allows uh, and stuff. And so, so... If you want inspiration on world building, look for resources on writing and, and writers and, and novelists and stuff like that. And that's that's where you can find a lot of really great information. Again, they can be massive rabbit holes you can go down. Um, but but again, um, writing novels, you know, is is probably the the best parallel to this for game designers. And you know, and so whether you're actually writing a novel, whether you're writing a movie, or just world building for games, or whatever you're doing. Again, um, look for resources that were designed for people writing novels. Um, those tend to have probably some of the best um, um, resources you know, out there. All right. Kligan, if I hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, what would you consider the best option? This is a character that always wins and barely shows defects or one that loses most of the time and starts winning towards the end of a story. So there's no right or wrong answers here. As, as a designer, as a creative director, as a writer, um, everything everything's viable, right? So, so you can have somebody who is um, very, very powerful and you can also have somebody who's very weak and, and both of those, um, what they need to have in common, what, what the, what, what your first, you know, I'd say that the second one, if I had to choose one or the other, is the path I usually take. Um, but both both examples are very valid. But what's important in world building, and we'll talk about this specifically in the character section, but but I would argue that, that the same, I guess you could call it a concept, um, about how um, in a world change is important. Now, you'll hear quite often that, that, um, that change you know, and especially in characters, is, is often called a character arc. And a character arc um, is also very relevant to story arcs. And, and that can also be, you know, I, I believe in the world arc and in many things. And what that means is that, that things, no matter what it is, need to change over time to be interesting. If, if things are flat all the way across, like if this character is always the same person, if this character is always the same power, this character has the same personality. If he starts off as a, as, you know, is a complete, you know, powerful character and then he finishes at the exact same level and he never like did any kind of change throughout it, it's boring, right? It, we, we, we as human beings like unpredictability. And so the same thing could be um, said for like the pacing of a story, the pacing of a game, the pacing of things, right? You don't want to just have the game 
you know, storyline or the movie storyline be like an action sequence. Like you don't want to have a two hour car chase in a movie, right? It, because we get, you know, th this is part of a deeper conversation we'll have in the storytelling um, topic, but you, you want to have change, right? You want to have, you know, things that are really intense and then you want to have things that kind of go slow and you have really intense and kind of go slow. So the same thing with the character, you want to have like, you know, like he's good for a while and then maybe he's a little bit bad and then he's kind of good. He plays in these gray areas and that kind of stuff becomes far more interesting, um, you know, than, than um, somebody who's very predictable, right? And I would argue that if, um, if you guys don't know um, who, who Joseph Campbell is, if you don't know um, about the hero's journey and the hero with a thousand faces, um, I would highly, highly, highly recommend um, you guys go out and pick up um, the book. Also on YouTube, if you, um, if you search for Joseph Campbell, um, he's um, recently passed away or, or a number of years ago passed away, um, but he was the foremost expert in mythology pretty much in the world. And he was actually a mentor of George Lucas's. And he was actually one of the guys that helped write some of the original Star Wars movies. And his idea of a hero's journey um, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and also, if you guys haven't seen it, I have a, an article up on um, Gama Sutra called um, The Hero's Journey. Let me see. Um, give me one second here. I think this is... Um, relevant for you guys in this conversation um, to to look at. And I think it's still here, although I, I do believe they, were, they pulled out one of the things. I need to kind of repost this. Um, and um, let's see. Here this is here. So let me post this, um, this link here in the chat. Um, so, so that's, that's a link to this article here that I, it's a little bit old, but it's still very relevant. Um, and again, I encourage you guys to, to go out and read this and I'll, again, I'm gonna have to look, there was an accompanying document with this that I think last time I checked, Gama Sutra might have stripped out. Um, let me see if it's actually still there. Um, Let me see. Give me one second here. Yeah, they have some of it there, but it is still a little bit um, there. And also, at the end of this, there is a additional references. There's this Hero with a Thousand Faces with Joseph Campbell. Um, also, I really love the, the book The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogel, which talks about the nine-act story structure. Um and, um, and then um, the nine-act story structure here by David Siegel. So there's a few um, references there that are also would be good for you guys to, to read. That the, This is all related to, to world building, right? And, and so, um, but Cligan, to, to answer your, kind of your question, like th this is about, you know, how does a, ch how does a character change through, through time, right? And, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but, but that change through time, if you think about like Luke Skywalker, for example, he, you know, he starts off as this young kind of naive kid, he's on Tatooine, and he gets this call to adventure, right? And then he ultimately meets Han Solo, goes off the planet, and he goes off and saves the universe, right? So he, he starts off very weak, and ultimately, you know, saves the universe um, through it. So he's not doing the same acts, the same things throughout the entire story of the Star Wars you know, universe. And then he continues to grow you know, over the nine movies. So that, that hero's journey and that stuff is um, all about that, right? It's all about how do characters change over time. And I think it's a, it's a really good lesson and some really great advice. And we'll try to get excuse me, more into that maybe in another live stream because it's, it's definitely like its own topic in and of itself. Um, so Cleegan, when you start your project and create your world and story, do you need to have, um, most of the lore and details done or is it something you craft and create, you keep creating more installments? Um, well, again, get into this, we're jumping ahead a little bit. Um, no, you need to understand where things are, but it's really some experience and some, and, and some things you have to kind of figure out. What is important for you to need to know and when? So what to me separates a good designer from a great game designer is knowing when to design what. So at the very end of a product, um, even if you're only designing your product, you have to design all of this, right? But but if you try to design all of this 
day one, you're going to be in trouble. So, and then if you think about the world building, and the world building is much bigger, you, you don't have the time to design all of this lore and all this backstory and all this history right at the start. But what's important is to kind of recognize areas that, that need to be designed at some point and some things that are there. And then you'll come and design those things when you have time and when you have the ability to do it. But, but it's a cycle of kind of defining again these black boxes, I call them, these areas that are undefined, but you know they exist. They know that they have to be there. And then at some point you'll come back and, and figure that out. But, but you have to kind of know when to come back and do those things. And I, and I see professional teams, I mean, some of the best teams in the world make this mistake, in my opinion, all the time, where they will deep dive in their story for months and then and then they'll come back and figure out the gameplay and now they're in trouble because the gameplay and the story don't align right and so that's where it can be really easy to go down these rabbit holes and make these mistakes and that's why I keep kind of quantifying it but I can't give you a really solid answer on this because every game is a little different um, and every universe is a little different and you might need to know the backstory of something in order to say for instance design the character just right Right. You might want to have their armor or something even just like have some thing in it. Like, you know, for example, you know, it might have a big you know hole in it, you know, and the character might have a big scar across his face. And at some point you're going to need to know and explain that. Right. Maybe. I mean, you, you know, so so you might have these things that are there. And so in your lore, you might have had where, yeah, you got in this really bad fight. And this guy put this big scar down his face here and you got another fight and the guy blew like a big hole in his in his armor, which almost killed him, and that set him off down this path of revenge, and ultimately that might set up the whole story, right? So is that an important detail or not? Is it something that's just there for visuals and to make it interesting you never explain it, or is it something that's there because it really drives and motivates the whole story? And so you kind of have to use your common sense to go like, okay, how much detail do I do I need to put in there for now um, And you know, versus how much do I just sort of need to know like, Okay, this was a this was a hole in his armor. He almost died from it. Now he's pissed off and he's going to go find the guy that did it, right? Maybe it's only that deep. Maybe it's just a couple lines. It doesn't necessarily have to be hundreds or, or thousands of, of pages, right? So, Cleggan. So, I always imagine a character that was always wrong or, or strayed in the struggle to make things right. But he, she manages to success um, his or her death. No, I mean... I can't answer your question. I mean, again, there's no rights or wrongs here, right? This is world building. This is you as a creator have to figure out what, what you like and why, right? And and so um, there is a lot of characters that are gray, right? There, there's characters that are black and white, like good and bad. But there's a lot of characters that are gray. And, and as long as they have motivation, as long as you understand what those characters are, um, that can be interesting, right? And so so playing with this type of a character um, or even somebody who's, who's perceived as bad but still has a good heart right there's been stories and lots of stories of characters that were that way where even Darth Vader or somebody you know has a change right they start off as just you think is this horrible person you know and in the end you realize they they kind of fell into this trap they fell into this thing and you know in the end they they kind of regret it or, or they they struggle with it and they might change to becoming good at the very end or things like that right so so bad doesn't always have to stay bad you know and so on and so forth um, so you just have to sort of be, be aware of that, right? All right. So let's, um, dive into the slides a little bit. <laughs> so, um, I, I hope, um, this is useful for everybody. Um, hopefully I'm explaining this well and trying to try, I'm trying to give you guys a lot of real world examples of, of again, like how, um, um, world building is done, right? How, how are these things handled? Um, and, and stuff, because I think that's, again, a, a really important um, thing of like the, the how to do world building is really the, the hard part. So it's very easy to talk a lot about the theory of these things, but it's, it's a lot harder to talk about, you know, the, the like, how do I actually implement these things? And so it's it's so bear with me, because, again, this is this is not an easy topic today. Um, this is a very big topic. And, you know, in all reality. I could probably teach a, a full semester, if not a full year, of of this topic. Like this is this is a very big topic, so don't feel bad if this is moving kind of fast or if it's a little bit overwhelming. So, the blasphemer. Um, 
Great. I'm glad you're you're finding this this interesting. And again, keep in mind that even if you're an artist, this is still a very relevant topic, right? To understand like how do I design my characters? Why do they look like it? Like I say, this guy that has a scar across his face and a guy that's got the hole in his chest, like is that something um, that just is there for you to make a interesting visualization of a character that just makes him have a little bit of character in your character, as they say, right? Like, you know, how do you make this guy look interesting? Or is that thing in there to serve a purpose? Is that thing in there to serve a point? And so, so this is where artists, game designers, creative directors, writers, and your entire team need to be involved in these, in this process, right? This is not something that one person can do alone. And so, but I want you guys to kind of start to see, and again, we're, 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 we're mile high today, right? We're, we're looking down at kind of world building as a big picture. This is an introduction today, right? And, and so I want you guys to kind of sort of see how it matters, right? Why does it matter that you work together in your team? Why does it matter that you have all these different aspects from art, design, you know, and everything else that all kind of have to come together to make this thing interesting? And then why would you want to make it interesting, right? So now when you get started in world building, you know, sometimes we're lucky and, and sometimes we literally just get to wake up in the morning and go like, Hey, I got an idea or, Hey, I get to do something today. Like I may not even have an idea yet. Like I just know, like I got a game that's coming up. I need to make a game and I need an idea for that game and I can just do whatever in the whole world I want to do. Right. And sometimes we're lucky. Sometimes we get that, that ability that, that we can do whatever we want to do. And, and that's, you know, the best place as a creative for me that, that, that I love to be in. Um, but we also have to recognize that um, that's not the perfect world, right? And, and so I would, I don't know percentage wise how often I've got to start from scratch versus how much I've had to work with an existing IP, but I would say that 50 to 75% of all the projects I've worked on have been um, part of somebody else's universe, part of somebody else's IP. That could be a Star Wars game. You know, that could be something that is a, um, uh, you know, a sequel to another game. I'm doing Halo 2, 3, 4, you know, whatever that is. You know, it could be based off, you know, a, a movie license, a book license, you know, toy lines, you name it, right? There, there's lots and lots and lots of places there um, that, that an idea could start from. So, for you as a game designer or as a creative, you have to kind of sometimes look and say like, okay, is this a blank slate? Or is this like got all these things here and, and do those things now, do I understand those things and do those things, are those things going to be capable of making a great product? And, um, and I've talked about this a little bit in the past, but I'll mention it again because it's relevant to world building. You know, I have worked on probably more licensed IP than anybody I know of and maybe not in the industry, but I definitely have, have, have worked on dozens and dozens of licensed IP. So whether that's, you know, Star Wars, James Bond, you know, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, you know, um, that type of stuff. I, I've worked on, you know, massive you know, movie based franchises, book based franchises, you know, to sequels from, you know, Ratchet and Clank to whatever. Um, you know, I've worked in a, a tremendous number of universes that were pre-established at some level. But depending on the game you're going to build, depending on the, what you're trying to build, you may or may not um, have enough to work with. And this is actually can be a problem for a lot of us in that we we may not have everything we need. And the licensor, especially if it's a licensed product that we have to have approval on to if we're gonna expand it, could be um, could be really tricky and can be really difficult. And this is something you have to kind of be aware of um, day one is what do I have to work with? What do I have to exist? And and so um, so sometimes you have to do a lot of, of research and you may, I mean, you may have to start with watching movies, reading books, you know, doing stuff, you know, if it's real world, you might have to know real history or, or real mythologies. You might need to go watch all the Lord of the Rings movies or, or other kinds of things, right? Um, like you'll see the statue here. You can kind of see in the background, um, uh, if you can tell that's Boba Fett, um, that was a, a statue that's made out of car parts that I actually got in Thailand, um, and I bought that long time ago when I was actually working on a Boba Fett game. And, and Boba Fett's been one of my favorite characters in the Star Wars universe and somebody I've always, you know, loved. And so I was excited when I got handed the opportunity to make a Boba Fett game, you know. And so not only did I have to read or watch the first movies, which he plays some small parts in, but 
he plays a huge part of the extended universe. So in the comics, the books, you know, all the extended universe and the Star Wars stuff and even other games and, and things like that. And so I literally probably spent a month just researching and like making a Bible basically of everything that he existed in and all the storylines and things and, and stuff and trying to make heads or tails of like what was the truth, what wasn't the truth and not all of it was made sense and some of it conflicted, you know, and things like that. And so, so it was a real pain in the butt. But I became kind of the expert on Boba Fett, you know, and kind of created this whole thing. And it was interesting then that even Lucas Licensing was calling me and asking me questions about Boba Fett and stuff. Because I, I knew more about him than anybody. And then unfortunately, long story short, I was getting all these weird calls. This was before episode one came out. Um, I was working on this game. And I was getting all these really weird calls from Lucas Licensing. And then um, and then, then they started talking about Jenga Fett. And I was like, Jenga Fett? Like, he doesn't exist. Like, that's not somebody that's in the Star Wars universe at this point. And I found out that he got written into, like, the Star Wars Episode One and, like, this whole thing. And then it completely shattered the whole Boba Fett, you know, universe. And so, ultimately, it killed my project because it literally invalidated my storylines and, like, everything I had been building in this game all got killed because Jenga Fett got introduced in Episode One. Um, so... That was that really sucked, and that was like six or eight months of really hard work, you know, on that game. Um, got broken thanks to George, but that that happens. But point is, is that I had to go out and learn about this IP, and then I had to figure out how to extend it, how to expand it. And so there was a lot of stuff in the universe with Boba Fett, or when I did the Star Wars, you know, Force Commander or RTSs and things, where I had to expand the universe. I had to know like what else I needed in order to make that kind of game. And then I'd have to go back to the licensor and try to expand it and stuff. And so so when you're working in somebody else's universe, it's 10 times harder. And, and it's a lot more complicated by by a long shot. Um, now, it can help you because you don't have to, to to write every single little detail. You don't have to create every single little thing. So you one hand, you get a jump start. You can maybe work a lot faster. But on the same hand, you're putting sometimes a box that's really small. And you're like, ooh, I, I can't make that game in that box I have. And so that's one of the challenges in world building is how do you make the best product you can um, sometimes with what you've got. And if we don't have a blank slate, um, that can be really tricky. And so so for today's conversation, we're going to really kind of focus on blank slate. But I want you guys to understand that if you're not working in a blank slate, um, it's going to get really complicated and can get, you know, and, and can be a lot harder. So... Part of what you have to kind of initially understand is what kind of game do you want to make? And in one hand, you can step back from that and say like, I don't care, right? And, and that's very valid when you're world building. You can step back and just say like, look, I'm going to create a universe that can have any kind of game in it, right? But if you're going to do that, you have to understand from a game designer's perspective especially, um, what is it in that universe that, that is going to allow it to make any kind of game? So, for example, a real-time strategy game um, needs, a, needs a, a certain number of units to really make it a viable product. And so that's the problem I had on like Star Wars Force Commander, even though that was a horrible game. And please don't even, I, I'm embarrassed to even admit I worked on it. But, um, but that was a, an example of where even in, the, in the, the massiveness of the Star Wars universe, we didn't have enough units to actually create a real RTS. And so we had to create a lot of new units um, and things like that. And so, so that's an example of even if it's your own universe you're trying to create, if you're trying to create something that's going to be um, used in, say, an RTS and an FPS, you know, you have to be very aware of like what are the things from a gameplay perspective ultimately um, are you going to need that to, to make that universe really function, to make that game really fun, right? Uh, for example, on a first person shooter, if, if you def define your main character is like having these signature guns, right? And I actually had this problem in a, in a, in a game. And doing a movie-based game, the, the, key, the key character had his signature pistols, and that's all he used throughout the movie. Well, when I tried to introduce, and I was like, look, guys, we're doing a FPS. Like, I need to have multiple weapons, and, and I need to have variety so that I can make the game more fun and more interesting. And they were like, nope, you can't. Like, this guy, that's his signature pistols. He only uses those. And so, like, literally they wanted me to make an FPS with only the same two guns the entire time. Um, and it just wasn't fun. You know, it was, it was really hard to change that, right, when I was stuck there. And so that's an example of where you, if you don't understand the rules long-term of what your gameplay needs, what your IP needs, what the universe needs, um, 
sometimes you can get yourself in trouble because you start to put in these walls and you start to start to define these things and then you realize like oh wait I shouldn't put that wall there because I might need to move it later right and so if I spend a lot of time defining the, the, this whole universe with this wall there and then ultimately realize later on it needs to get moved I just wasted a bunch of time and so that's where you want to start really high level and kind of work your way down deeper and deeper and deeper with more and more and more detail over time. But it, but if you deep dive into one thing really deeply, um, you know, you may it may sound like the, the best idea in the world, but you also then have to go like, is that going to be fun? Is that interesting? Or, you know, even from an art, artist side, like I've had this problem where the artist um, conceptually came up with some really great characters. And they were very innovative and very unique, and you know, and they had some, you know, like multiple tentacles and like all these kinds of things, and they were they were super cool looking, and they worked in the game. But ultimately, um, it was a franchise that we wanted to make a toy line out of. And when we went and talked to the toy manufacturer, the toy manufacturer was like, "Oh, we can't do that. Like that's they're they're too thin. They're gonna break, you know." And ultimately, we had to redesign the characters because they weren't gonna make good toys. And so, so that was one of those little things like we didn't even think about. But but you know. But if we had defined that as a need, you know, ahead of time, if we had understood that that was something we needed to do ahead of time, we would have saved ourselves a lot of rework by understanding that these characters that we were designing needed to be toys and that physical product and physical toys had certain rules. They had certain things that they needed to kind of be close to in order to really make it a toy, right? And to make, you know, to physically manufacture it in the plastic molding and that kind of thing, right? And so, so sometimes you have to be thinking about those things um, and be thinking 10 steps ahead, you know, when you're trying to define a universe, right? So when we're world building, we are thinking much bigger, you know, I mean, we may be thinking again about how to design this thing for multiple genres, for toy lines, for movies, you know, and are these things interesting, right? You know, and is that something that people are going to want to see, play with, buy, use, touch, you know, or whatever. And that, and that's why this process of world building is a hundred times harder than just building a product, right? And so I, I'm caveating this a lot because I really want you guys to understand that it, 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 this is a really complicated thing, but, but I'm trying to show you how to get started, right? So, um, so Keegan, um, sometimes it may be um, complicated putting coherence and sense when you create a story around the rules of the world, like characters' actions that affect other ones in the future or the past. So I'm not sure exactly your question there, but yes, I agree. Um, it is it is very complicated, and 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 so when you try to tie the world and the characters and and all of these things together, right? It it easily easily overwhelms you, especially if you're new there. And so again, I I, I reference back to my my a few weeks ago. I have a, a a topic on systemic design, and I would argue that this same problem falls into solving it at least at some levels and tackling it in in a systemic way, right? And that we know that this universe has a lot of things there, right? And if we start listing those out, we start putting those into bullet points and then we start to say like, okay, we know that we have the world. We know we have characters. We know that under characters, we have NPCs and villains and, you know, all these things, right? And then under that, we know that we have bosses and sub bosses and, you know, these things. And, 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 and if we use logic, then a lot of a lot of these problems go away when we understand how to logically tackle and approach some of these things. And so so think about world building in a very systemic way and that helps you to not get overwhelmed. And that really again you're defining these boxes that you know initially there's some characters, but like do I know what characters are in there day 1? No. I don't know what those are, but I know that I need characters. Right? And so at some point whether that's on day 2 or week you know to or month to right at some point i have to fill out that black box a little bit more and maybe turn that into 10 more small black boxes but if we think about it in again systemic ways you know we know how to tackle that a little bit better and so then we start to understand how these things work together right how these things fit together and that's it, it's hard. And again, that's where this is, this is not an easy topic. And so I just really want you guys to not get frustrated and not get overwhelmed if you try this process, because again, it, it is really hard to do. So again, you know, where do you start, right? And what, what do you have to work with? And keep in mind that certain 
genres, you know, also have conventions. So, for example, in fantasy, you can go off and do a fantasy world that is completely new and unique, but it might be almost borderline science fiction, you know, in the sense that does a does your fantasy world have dragons? Does it have orcs? Does it have goblins and trolls and you know elves and all these things that we would identify as a D and D Tolkien esque style fantasy world? Now it doesn't mean that it has to have all of it, right? But but is it recognizable in true traditional fantasy, or is it all new, right? And and there's definitely a time and a place for when to innovate. And when to, to do that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So I don't want to jump ahead there. But when you're when you're creating something that might be, if you make the decision to say like, look, this is going to be, you know, very traditional Tolkien-esque fantasy. Now, again, that doesn't mean that everything's going to be there. But that helps you define day one, a lot of your world. You know, a lot of your stuff can be like, okay, look, I can go to my character section and, and under races, know that I've got orcs and elves and trolls and humans, and, and I know that these things exist. And under characters, I might know that I have, or under creatures, you know, I might know that I have dragons, and I might have unicorns, and I might have these things, right? And so what you're trying to kind of do day one is, to, is, is even if you're bullet pointing those things in, you might, you might put the bullet point of dragon in there, but... But that doesn't necessarily mean that you got to keep it in there, right? And so a lot of what you're kind of doing is saying to yourself, like you, you put that bullet point in and you say dragon. And you, know, and you might even say question mark. Like, like, does that thing belong, right? And you might sit on that and you might look at that and you might think about it. And you kind of go, you know, like, do I want dragons in there or not, right? Like, what does that mean? And what does a dragon mean? And what's the gameplay associated with a dragon? And... And so on and so forth. And so you might think about dragons a bunch. And in the end, you may go, eh, you know, I don't want dragons. I don't, I don't have to have dragons in my game to make it successful. Or do I want something that's more mythological? And do I want the, the, the mythology to exist for dragons? You'll see this a lot in especially Chinese culture. Um, the Chinese dragons... Um, you're never quite clear if they're historical or if they're mythological. And so they might reference, um, especially in like Monkey King and, and various like mythological stories within, within Chinese culture, they may reference dragons, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll ever see a dragon. So this could again be what a hook. You might have somebody who tells a story about seeing a dragon and you don't know if he's lying. You don't know if it's, if it's mythology, if he was on drugs and, and drunk and, you know, imagining it. Um, or what, but, but that one tentacle of like, Hey, this one guy saw a dragon right now, maybe that's all there is in your universe. Maybe that's all in your entire game, your movie, whatever that you ever define. But later you're like, I got that little hook. There, there might be dragons in the world, right? There might be something there. And so by, by putting that hook in there, it allows you to open that door later. But whether you define dragons really carefully right now, and whether you have all the nuances and all the gameplay and all that stuff isn't critical, but you're really just, but you're, you're potentially putting a hook in there. And at least at a minimum, as a designer, you're asking yourself the question of like, does this thing belong, right? What is this thing? How does this thing function? Is it cool? Is it unique? Is it special? And is it something that I want in my world, right? And so that's the that's the more important question is for you to sort of be able to look at these things and say, like, do I want that? Right. So that's what you're really trying to do in this world building process is it's, it's, it's as much to challenge yourself, to ask yourself these questions or your team members, whoever you're working with, to say, like, like, what would it mean if we put in these big, powerful dragons, you know, and these things that are that are um big and powerful and maybe undefeatable or have these other nuances in the, in the game or in that story. Like, what does that mean? Like what, what, how's that going to change our universe? Right. And, and that could change it for the better or for the worse. Right. Because suddenly it's like, how does that thing get abused? How does that thing get used? Um, you know, and stuff. And when you're designing a game, those things can have ramifications sometimes that you don't even, um, 
understand even yourself as a game designer when you first design that thing um, for your world. So, Kligan, it's like you may have the simplest design characters, but the story is um, it's really compelling. The product will sell really well. It could. I mean, um, again, part of, in my opinion, part of what makes an incredible story, so what, what takes you from having an okay story to a really great story are really compelling characters. And so if you try to build a, a really good story without um, great characters, I personally think you fail. I actually think you, you will be, you will create a more interesting story Usually, if you have great characters, um, and then the rest of the story can actually be a little bit more generic or there. But it really depends on the nuances and what you're trying to build. Um, but as human beings, we relate better to characters and, and stuff. And that's one reason why even like when we're designing like aliens in a science fiction um, story, the more, what do you call it? Um, the more unique, the more special or different that something is from us as humans, the more we don't relate to it. So you could create a alien that is completely non-humanoid and they have absolutely no correlation to human characters. But if you try to humanize them, if you try to, to put emotion behind them, you don't always, you don't always, you're not going to understand facial expressions. You're not going to understand body language. You may not understand their language or their words and those kinds of things. And so we don't have empathy for those characters. And so this is a deeper story problem to have and, and stuff, but it's those relationships to characters and to people into that human experience that ultimately um, actually is probably the more compelling thing in stories for most people. And so don't overlook that, right? That's something you definitely need to, to understand of the importance of characters um, in your story. Excuse me. Yeah, so Keegan, I read some more question. It goes, do the characters create a story? Does the story lead construct the characters? Both can be true. You know, there, there's no right or wrong there. And in fact, I would argue that in the perfect world, they're both true, right? You, you want to have your characters themselves driving a lot of the story um, and and making that story more interesting because those characters exist in the story. And on the same hand, you want to have um, the storylines and the circumstances in that story drive the characters to become more interesting. Um, so, for example, if you again look at Star Wars, because I use that as an example of something that most of you or hopefully all of you have have seen and watched and and if any of you on this live if anybody watching this now live or in the recording have not seen star wars and you're trying to get into the entertainment industry like stop everything today and go watch at least episodes four five and six if not all nine of them um they really are seminal works that that we need to understand you know because they become a common reference and language of just how like i'm using them today to explain things. They become a language that we use to explain stuff um, in in our world. And so that's something we need to, to understand. But to your point, part of what um, that can happen. So for example, if you look at episode four, Star Wars, in the very beginning on Tatooine, and Luke goes chasing after the droids and he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi and he ultimately comes back to his farm where he where he lives. His aunt and uncle have been killed. Um, you know the stormtroopers came looking for the droids, and they killed they they, they killed the, the his aunt and uncle looking for the droids. And in the in the Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, that's considered the call to adventure. So that was something that, that Luke was kind of given um, the call earlier when he when he gets the message from like R2-D2, he's kind of given a little bit of a like, hey, you should go or you can go on this adventure. But he's kind of what they call the reluctant hero and he doesn't want to do that. You know, initially he's scared, you know, and his, and his aunt and uncle don't want him to leave. And so then when he gets back there and they're dead, um, the, the, the Luke is then sort of forced to go on this adventure. He's forced to go into the city 
and Tatooine and, and find Han Solo and go on this journey, right? And this is something that the storyline um, is ultimately driving who Luke becomes. So you could sort of argue that the, that the storyline in that, in that story that Luke himself caused it, but really that was a case of the story, meaning his parents um, or his aunt and uncle dying, where the catalyst that ultimately created Luke Skywalker, the galactic hero and leader of the, the, the Rebellion and the Jedi Knight, right? So if that, arguably, if his, if his aunt and uncle had never been killed by the stormtroopers, Luke would have never gone on his quest and his journey, right? And the universe would have been a very different place. So I think that kind of illustrates how that was driving Luke. But in the same hand, Luke's ability with the Force and his backstory and who his parents were and his connection to Darth Vader um, and Anakin Skywalker and all these other things were ultimately also the catalyst that brought that about. Um, so they were both working towards the same goals to ultimately make this interesting character and the interesting story. So, how do you build this? Um, ultimately, in a lot of games, we create what's called the World Bible. And the World Bible is kind of like a GDD or a game design document on Uber steroids. Um, it usually is not too detailed on gameplay, but it, it is a lot of story. Um, but it could also again relate to art and, and, and gameplay designs and other things, but it's really a, 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 a universe Bible that shows, you know, who all the characters are, where all the locations are, you know, what all the stuff is in the world and things like that. And so, um, so for bigger franchises, you know, they will build out these very elaborate Bibles that I've seen 500 to a thousand pages or more. Um, with these big Bibles, they're just these big tombs of like everything that's in the universe, right? And, and in some cases, that just gets kind of built organically, meaning that like there's just kind of documents everywhere. And there's just kind of stuff that everybody's kind of done and it all sort of is there, but it may or may not be put into a cohesive place. And um, the, um, but the, the World Bible is, is kind of meant to be, and again, not not many games really build these. So this is, again, the, the perfect idealized world, right? This is not necessarily the reality of every game production. In fact, I would say 20% of the games at most that I've worked on have actually built a world Bible. So th this is not necessarily something that's there, but this is, again, something to strive for or, or, or work towards. Um, but this is just a, a home for all that that documentation for all that information and, and allows for consistency. And then especially if you were going to go build a movie or, or a comic book or whatever it is that all that stuff keeps adding to it. And then everybody knows exactly like what happens in the universe. And again, some things may be black boxes. Some things may still be in there. Like, yeah, there is a planet here, but we know nothing about it. We know its name and maybe that's it. Right. And so the World Bible may only have that one page or that one sentence that references something, but at least it's there. It kind of gets referenced and, and then people know like, okay, that's a point that can be expanded later. So the World Bible can be a very elaborate, you know, elaborate thing. Now, where this becomes um, important is, is especially as you start to work across multiple games, multiple mediums, um, this, this becomes a really important concept. And there's a, there's a term called transmedia storytelling. And we won't get into it in this talk. We'll, we'll talk about transmedia storytelling when we talk about storytelling. If you're not familiar with it, please Google it and, and look at it. Um, a lot of the transmedia storytelling was, um, I think, if I remember right, it was originally pioneered by Henry Jenkins um, from MIT. Um, and But the idea is that um, this idea of how do you tell stories across multiple mediums that all reinforce each other and work together. So this could be that, you know, I'm telling part of the universe's story in a game, part of it in a movie, part of it in a TV show, part of it in a comic book, part of it in the toy line, part of it on a website, right? And all these things work together to tell this one big universe story, but somebody at some point has to kind of design that thing, this big massive juggernaut that's sailing, you know, that's it's huge and massive, but somewhere, somehow that all has to be very consistently designed. And, and so transmedia storytelling is this concept of like, how do you do that really well? And how do you tell stories across multiple mediums 
um, and keep it consistent and, and really like use each medium for what it does best, you know? And, and so we have to remember that like interactive stories like in games are good for one thing, you know, um, linear stories in like a movie or a TV show um, are good for other things, right? And and the amount of story and how we tell stories on websites or, or through snippets of, of things and blogs or whatever we're using in social media or whatever that is, that all kind of is telling a little bit of story. Like, what is this universe? Like, what is this thing there? Transmedia is kind of all about that, right? It's about building this full franchise and then figuring out all these intricacies there. It's incredibly complicated. Um, it's very fun. You know, so if you're into that kind of stuff, it, it can be really exciting, but... Um, but if you're not familiar with it, I wanted to at least just make you aware of the term for now. And then later on, hopefully we'll get into and do a talk on transmedia storytelling in general. But again, if you don't know about it, or if you've never heard about it, um, um, you know, go, go look at it. So Kagan, um, a, a linear story is, you know, if you think about a movie, right? A, a movie or a book or most books, um, sort of a choose your own adventure book, you know, they, they have a, a beginning, a middle and an end, right? They go down a, a linear path. Right, so 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 a TV story is good in that it, it it drives the player or drives the viewer, you know, down this experience that, that's very precise. But in a game, um, games are nonlinear, right? Um, now, I'll caveat that to say that not all games are nonlinear. So so there is linear game stories, meaning like I could be on a first person shooter or some kind of game that follows a path right and i'm and i'm going to go from a to b to c to d as i'm progressing from you know mission one to two to three to four and it's in this very linear path or games can be the polar opposite of that like an open world game where i can literally go from you know a to z to d to b to a you know and, and then back to z and then to, to m and you know and i can be bouncing around the world and be doing a lot of the stories in, in different ways. And there's a lot of different structures on how stories can be done that we'll talk about in the weeks to come. But but linear stories are really, you know, um, any kind of movie or TV show or, or most novels and books are going to be linear because they're telling a story from start to finish. And the user, the viewer, the reader does not have a choice about where the story is going to go or in which order they're going to, that they're going to consume that story. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Now, lastly, when you're getting started, again, is what do fans expect? What do they want and what do they require? So this can be, again, the challenge of if you're making a game that's based on modern day, if you're making a, you know, a game based on reality, if you're making a, you know, a game you know, based on historical stuff, um, if you're making a fantasy game, like we talked about, like you know, if, you're, if you're selling this thing as like a Tolkien-esque D&D fantasy universe, and then you change a rule and you change something in that universe, it can confuse people quite a bit. And, and so, for example, the things with dragons, um, you know, now dragons in a lot of stories have been good and bad. So, so they're, they are kind of a, uh, a neutral kind of character that quite often can go either way in stories. And sometimes can it be both. There could be good and bad dragons in stories. So dragons are like an example of something that can kind of go both ways, but but like, for example, orcs. Orcs in a fantasy world are always pretty much bad. I don't, I don't know that I've ever read a fantasy book or, or done anything where there's been good orcs. I mean, maybe, thinking back on, maybe there's something where there was a, a particular orc that was good or somebody that was there. But the point is that, that in these genres, right, these particular things might always be seen as is a bad guy. Um, think about like the aliens and alien, the aliens movies. Like the aliens... There's no good in an alien. There's never going to be an alien that doesn't know. It's like, hey, buddy, you want to go out and have drinks? And like, let's go grab a beer and, you know, and like, go hang out tonight. Like, th that's not what an alien does. He just eats you, right? And um, so so if you set the expectation and you're doing, you know, let's just say again, like aliens versus predator, you know, and suddenly like the aliens are your friends and the predators or, you know, whatever, like, People are going to get confused. They're like, wait, 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 wait. That, that's not what I want out of an Aliens vs. Predator game. Like, uh, why and how would an alien ever be my friend? Like, I'm confused, right? And so so that's where fan expectations sometimes... Um, and I'm trying to use an extreme example of this. But fan expectation can quite often get us in trouble. Because the expectation of what this thing is... Um, quite often will upset people or again, they come in with a certain preconceived expectation of what their, 
want to experience. And then when you don't give that to them, if you don't give them a really good example or reason for why that's not that way, they may get really upset or, or very frustrated. So you do have to be careful there. So, um, anyways, let me move along here because we're going a little bit slow, but it's okay. This is a big topic. And again, we'll continue next week, you know, where we leave off. So the first thing you really kind of want to do when you're, when you're getting in here is, is do research. And, you know, we, we talked about this. I won't go into detail too much about this, but, but if you, if you go back a couple weeks there, I had a class on ideation. Um, so this is kind of that type of thing, right? Where you want to go in and you want to figure out like, what do I want in this universe? What, you know, again, like if I'm doing something, um, um, interesting. So, so, um, let's, let's go here really quick and just show you, like, let's do something where I want to do, um, let's see, um, I want to do fantasy, um, oops, my spelling, I can't see, <laughs> misspelled, fantasy concept art. So as a brainstorming technique, again, like we could come in here and just, you know, as our first day one, like inspiration, and we may, we may decide, let's, let's just say we just decide, hey, we're going to do a fantasy game, right? And we, we don't know to what extent. Is it pure um, D&D, Tolkien-esque fantasy, or is it our own twist on it, right? So we may just come in here and start to, you know, start to browse and start to kind of go like, oh, wait, like, you know, like, oh, that's kind of cool, or that's kind of cool, or, you know, and we see these things that, that inspire us, you know, and we may go like, oh, I love that piece of art. Like, that's really cool. So, okay, let me let me save it, right? And, and let me, um, you know, keep that for, for future reference. And you just kind of go through and you're looking for things. And, you know, and, and these could be characters. They could be the world, the universe. You know, you may look at something and go like, oh, my God, that's, that's exactly, like, cool. You know, I mean, exactly what I wanted, you know, and those kind of things. Um, so, so, again, just doing the research, doing the inspiration, knowing what else is out there is a big part for me of the, the beginning of the world building process because I want to know what's my competition have. <coughs> Excuse me. And what are the expectations? <coughs> oh, down the wrong pipe. All right. <coughs> so this comes to, again, with the fan expectations of what are the rules for your universe? Right. What What are the rules that you're trying to establish in your universe? Right. And it's important that you set those rules. And especially if you're doing something that's kind of already pre-existing. So if you're working in modern day, historical, mythological, fantasy, whatever, you know, if you're doing a sequel to something, you're doing the next Halo game, whatever it is. If the universe has a bunch of established rules, you need to kind of abide by those or you need to very, very, very carefully change those and establish new rules. But you have to know like when to stick with things and, and and how to keep them consistent, right? And and so you want to make sure that you create these rules for your universe. So the players, when they go into these things, or the viewers, whatever, have expectations. They want to know like who's good and bad. They want to know like what are they supposed to do and where are they supposed to go, and you know, and and understand you know um, what that stuff is. Or you need to be very careful about. Um, when you're going to change those rules on them, do they have like some foreshadowing? Do they have, do they have something there that might warn you of that? Um, take for example, the movie, the movie, perfect dark, um, perfect dark with Vin Diesel. I thought was a, was a great, you know, popcorn flick. And if you guys remember, he, he gets his eyes adjusted so that his eyes can, can see in the dark. And it was, you know, and they had a, a whole backstory of why he did that and, and everything else. And then just by chance, you know, they crash land on this planet and the planet starts off during the day and kind of everything seems sort of nice. And, you know, it's not, it's a little bit of a barren, hostile desert planet, but it's kind of like, all right, you know, we get that, you know, that this is um, a dangerous place, but it's not too horrible. And then suddenly night comes and the worlds all change, right? And like all those thousands of really nasty creatures come out and those creatures are attracted to, you know, to the light, but they're also scared by it, you know, and they only have a limited amount of, of fire and lights and things to keep those creatures away. 
you know, and, and they're slowly changing the rules and they're going to be like, okay, so pretty soon, you know, Vin Diesel is the only one that's got the vision that he can see these things in the dark and can kind of fight them. He's also got the skills to do it and things like that. But that's a case of they kind of foreshadowed it um, and, and they preluded up to it. And, you know, but then they, because it was a linear story, they were able to kind of change the rules and they got away with it. Right. But if you were in a game and you had that same thing and you went like, hey, this world's really nice. This world's really great. And then all of a sudden, boom, everything's dangerous. Everything's going to kill you. And oops, sorry, you're dead. Like, that's not fun. Right. Like you, you, you got to build it up. You got to you got to make sure the rules in the universe make sense. So the player knows how to react to them, knows how to respond to them. You know, if if you see this big, huge, massive creature and it's like, Roar! and you just like it looks all scary. You know, it's ten stories tall and it's coming at you, and then suddenly it comes up and it's like, "Hey, how's it going?" You know, nice to meet you. You know, and that kind of thing where you're like, "Wait a second, this thing's um, friendly, but it looks scary and whatever." And like, and then you get to another creature and it's like this little cute, nice bunny, and he's all you know. Cuddly, you know, and he wants, you know, and you think like, oh, I want to go up there and make friends with him and, and all that. And then he comes up and he's just like, kills you, you know, and he's just like unbeatable, whatever. Like, again, the rules of the universe don't make sense to the player because we naturally associate things that are big and scary as dangerous and things that are small and cute and cuddly as nice there. And that's something that we as like human beings have kind of adapted, you know, throughout our history of, of, of how we represent things, you know, in stories, right? And so if you're world building and you're changing those rules and you're and you're like, well, we'll just throw all the rules out and we're just going to like, whatever, that can be done. Um, but you have to do it very slowly, very carefully, very precisely. And you have to teach those rules. You have to really make sure the player knows and, and you have to foreshadow, you have to build it. You have to, you know, maybe the player is, you know, in a safe place, like behind some glass, and he sees one of those cute bunnies jump in and then just like kill somebody like very quickly, right? And you're like, ooh, okay, that thing's a little nasty. Like he looks cute, but he's like that thing's, you know, like super deadly, right? And and so um, you know, but the player learned that rule, right? The player, you know, was taught that thing, and the world building allowed for that, right? So you need to to sort of again create rules for your universe. And and so you know, the same thing would be like, you know, if I got lava, you know, and, and it's and it's blue and it's, you know, whatever. Um, and that thing, if I step on it, you know, melts me. But if I don't know that, then as a player, I'm like, okay, what do I do? I'm walking through this world. I see this thing. I don't know what it is. How do I learn my lesson? Like, you know, if I have a load save, maybe I just jump in and go like, okay, what's going to happen, right? Now, that same substance could kill me or that same substance could heal me. Right, but if I don't know what that is, I don't. If I'm not told what that is, if I don't understand the rules of that universe, then it's really impossibly hard to um, to know how to experience that universe and really enjoy it. Um, that was actually true with a game called Impossible Creatures. Um, Impossible Creatures was a an RTS um, designed by Relic that I was overseeing when I was at Microsoft, and it was a project that was not very good, you know, and one of the reasons being is they had technology that allowed the players to, I think I've talked about this in previous um, talks, but they allowed allowed the players to create their own um, units. And there was literally, I think, almost a million combinations of units in that game that you could create. But the problem is, like, something that was really small, like these little bees could fly around and kill you in one sting, but then these, like, big, giant, you know, massive creatures that were like these gorilla you know, blue whale things or whatever. They looked big and scary, but they barely did any damage. And there were so many combinations of things that you didn't know what anything was. And you didn't know what the rules of the universe were, right? And so so you would look at something, you didn't know what it was, you couldn't understand it, and by the time you did, you died. And so now in a traditional RTS, if you only had, say, 20 to 50 units or something like that, um, on a side, you could eventually sort of learn maybe through the manual, website, whatever. You'd kind of know like, okay, I've got this unit, I've got this unit, I've got this unit. What's the rock, paper, scissors? What are these guys good for? And I would know then, I would be able to learn the rules and be able to know how to do it um, and how to, to, to play with that. But when you have a million of them, there's no way you can learn that, right? And so the rules of the universe were not establishable. You, you couldn't have the rules in that universe exist because there was too many rules, 
right? And so, so you need to be careful about how many rules you, you create or, or be able to have limits. Limits are okay. Limits are good because most people don't want to have to know a thousand things. And in fact, most people are overwhelmed by five or 10 things. Um, so you don't need to have a thousand rules for something to be interesting, right? But you need to have rules. And, if, and when those rules break our real world perception or the fantasy perception of something, um, again, fantasy perception being like, if I got a orc in a game and he's suddenly good, I need to explain that, right? You know, if, if something shifts from dangerous, you know, to friendly or, or vice versa, if something, you know, whatever, you need to make sure the player understands those things. Um, and again, you can have gray areas. You can have things that shift. You can have an orc that starts off as an enemy and ultimately becomes your best friend. You know, um, you could have, you know, those things change or shift over time. Like Darth Vader, who starts off as evil and then becomes good or kind of good, right? Um, or lots of gray areas there. So so just saying, like, th those things can shift over time, but you have to have the rules, you know? And and so you just, you, you need to establish these rules for universe. And I, I'm not saying that you have to, to establish all these day one, but you do need to have, you know, you do need to have some rules. Um, Um, so when you're world building, again, the, the rules are, are related to logic, right? And so, you know, you need to understand that rules and logic kind of go together. And so when you're, the point is, is when you're breaking logic, when you're breaking something that doesn't make any sense, um, you need to either not do that or do it very carefully with a lot of expl explanations. And this would be especially true if, you know, it's a historical thing or, or it's supposed to be realistic or whatever, um, if it's something that, that people were like, like, why would that happen? Like, for example, like you could have, um, you could, this is the struggle with like alternate, um, alternate timeline, alternate um, history um, projects. And that, you know, again, a lot of times they, they may have different rules for some reason because something shifted in their universe, you know, and they, and they, they, they explain it away, you know, that it's an alternate history or alternate universe, but like it can get really confusing. So for example, as an extreme example, like if you went into a World War II, what you think World War II era game is, and then suddenly again, the Nazis are running up to you and like they're your best friends, you'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm an American, you're a Nazi, like I kill you, I'm good, you're bad. Like that's very black and white, you know, in the real world, right? I mean, you would never have other than the occasional Nazis that, you know, defected or, you know, they're in real world, there was, you know, there was some Nazis that were trapped and they, they did it, you know, because they had to. But in general, as a whole, as an organization, as a group, Nazis were, you know, were bad. And so, so the rules are, I'm an American, I kill Nazis. But now if I create a universe where Nazis are good, you're like, whoa, wait a second. Like there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect there, right? And so, so you want to, again, use logic and when you break logic, you need to really make sure that there's there's an explanation there because if you don't explain it, people can get really frustrated. And so, but there's a lot um, that goes along, you know, goes along and relates to that. So the next thing, you know, in your in your world and in your universe that's really important to kind of understand, you know, and ask yourself is how unique do you want this thing to be? Now, in a typical game or movie or TV show, it, you know, things don't have to be 100% unique. Things do not have to be like every, in fact, again, unique can sometimes be bad, like too much unique can be bad, right? Th that's the reason why like science fiction stuff is often not as popular as fantasy um, for a lot of people is that, Fantasy has rules. People know what to expect there. And if you're going to do a brand new original science fiction world, people don't know the rules and they spend so much time trying to figure out the rules that they, they get confused and they get frustrated, right? Uh, but quite often as creatives, one of the, the good and bad things of what we do is we often feel that it's necessary for us to um, create stuff that's brand new and original. And like, we want to show how smart we are. We want to show how creative we are. We want to create something that's like totally new and unique, right? And so we'll, we'll go to all this effort to create this new and unique thing. And in the end, um, we just confuse people because it was too unique, right? So, so be careful here 
um, creating a, a, a project that is 100% unique with nothing that anybody's ever seen before can actually be a bad thing. And so as a general rule, I, I like to use the 70-30 rule of like 70% is familiar and 30% is new and, and or 80-20, you know, and, and so something on that lines um, makes it easier for you to, to know something there is kind of understood, something there is kind of normal, and then there's something that's, that's there that is unique. Now, if you don't have that 20%, you gotta ask yourself. Now again, if you're doing something historical or modern day, you may not be able to change a lot. You know, you may be stuck into certain things, and so you, but you do need to ask yourself, like, you know, even if it's in the gameplay or where, wherever that thing is, but you do need to ask yourself, like, um, what is it, you know, in this thing that, that makes it interesting, what makes it unique, what makes it something that people want to play? You know, and why why are they going to read your story, um, you know, versus somebody else's, right, and, and stuff. And so um, you got to be careful here because it's just, you know, again, you know, there's a lot of stuff that people have expectations for. Um, there's a lot of things that they might expect it to be realistic. They might expect it to be really authentic. And then you could change all that. And, and, you know, and then people are like, whoa, wait a second. Like, that's, again, like, not what I expected. And, again, if it was an alternate history or something like the Nazis, like, okay, explain it away that way, you know, and, and make sure that people understand that and it, and it can be acceptable. But if it's a real true historical project and now you're going to try to, like, change it and and tell everybody the Nazis are your friends, like, they're, they're not going to buy that. Like, they're going to be like, wait a second. Like, the, the, you know, this... They're, they're confused and it doesn't make any sense if you don't explain it, right? And people get caught up in these problems and it, and it can be something that really um, frustrates a lot of players because a lot of people are very logical, right? And they want to they know and understand how that logic, you know, sort of works. And so just, you know, just kind of be, again, be sort of aware of that, right? So, um, and again, like, you know, it, it's also good to have like twists and surprises, right? You don't want to necessarily have it like very predictable. And so that's another part of world building is again, what are those things that you can build towards? What are those things that you can, you can foreshadow, what you can allude to? What are the things that are not really black and white, night and day, you know, kind of things? Where's the gray areas that you can go play in, you know, and then through that, you can build up stuff that, that surprises players and makes it kind of interesting because that uncertainty that comes with building your franchise can be, you know, can be really, um, really fun for a lot of people. Okay, Kligan. Um, so if an inno innovating story um, may be kind of risky, then create a story that have already known concepts has to depend really well on the surprises and twists to get the attention of consumers. It depends. I mean, again, you know, you could make a a modern day, say, realistic game. Take like the Rainbow Six series, which I which I did. Like it, it's it's based on the the concept of a modern day special forces group, but it's not a real group that does not exist in real life, and so therefore the bad guys don't exist, and the world is unique, right? And so that is something that is um um a little bit easier to explain away because we are sort of in our real world, right? We have our real world, modern day idea, concepts, theories, or whatever, you know, that are there that we're using that, that helps us because then as storytellers, I may not have to explain everything, right? I may be able to sort of know and know what, what's in this universe, right? And I don't have to explain, you know, the fact that we're in the United States, and we've got a president, we've got this and that, and all that stuff makes sense, but it's also, um, innovative and in that it's not real real right and, and so that allows us to have that freedom to do new things with it and then through that also you know being more predictable you know or less predictable now if we are going to do an actual real world story you know movie game whatever that follows world war ii or follows modern day or you know afghanistan or whatever um if we're really trying to reproduce something historical or something that's even happening in today's current you know times um that gets a lot harder to innovate because you know we're following history right and we can't change so many details but again the, we we have to kind of look into that and say like okay where can we add unpredictability where where is the details like even most people they might know a high level story of like afghanistan for example and the battles that happened there 
and they know that Americans are fighting terrorists and you know or fighting you know the, these you know these people and hunting for bin Laden and whatever it is and, but they don't necessarily know that minute to minute story right so so while a lot of people may know the high level story of what's going on they may not necessarily know that second to second minute to minute hour to hour story that us as a player character in this particular story might be experiencing and so through that through through that the, that level of detail we can create something that has twists and turns and surprises and we're filling in the blanks right we're we're elaborating on stories that that people don't actually really know so we're we're placing ourselves in a universe there but still finding a place that we can that we can have creative freedom an example of that um is kind of a one-off to explain is I, I was working on a sequel to the movie 300. And if you guys saw the 300, it was also a very, 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 very loose Hollywoodized, you know, interpretation of the battle of Thermopylae, which was a real world, you know, historical event. Now the, the history of the battle of Thermopylae in Greece is not super, super, super clear. So they, they took a lot of creative freedom when they built that, that story in that movie and they definitely Hollywoodized it. They definitely sensationalized it. Um, but they, you know, they, they created something that was very fun, very interesting and, and stuff. Um, but it, it was not, again, perfectly historically accurate, you know. And, and so they, they were able to take a lot of, you know, freedom there. And then most people don't know. We might have kind of known like, yeah, there was these 300 guys and they fought a bunch of, you know, Persians and, you know, and that was probably the about depth of knowledge that 95% of the world or whatever had, you know, and so they were able to take creative freedom and do stuff there. Now, when I was at a company called Brash Entertainment, I actually got assigned to work on the sequel um, for 300. And we were gonna, um, we we're supposed to be doing the movie sequel and, you know, and a game to go with that. And long story short, the, the, the movie got kind of put on hold. So I got to go work on the game and I was told to go do what I want to do. And, and not tie it to the movie. And so in real world, in, the, in real history, after that battle, the Persians actually escape back into Persia. They, they run away. And there's actually about a 40 year history, 40 year period where there's no, no real world, um, um, what do you call it? Documents, um, stories, anything about the Greeks and the Persians during this period of time. So we actually don't know what really happened. There was this period of time where the Persians ran away. They basically rebuilt their their armies, and eventually they do they do attack again. Um, but there's this huge gap there where nobody really knew what was going on. So I chose that as is is my area that I could find creative liberties and, and create freedom in there um, that I could go play in this this thing. So I didn't have to create this whole universe. Like I knew. The Greeks and the Romans, the Persians, like all these things existed, that their units existed, the, you know, the 300 movie, you know, created a lot of the units and a lot of the, the capabilities and a lot of the characters, although all the 300 characters, you know, all died except for Delios, the, the, the storyteller of the movie. And so, you know, but that allowed me to have creative freedom to kind of go like, hey, I can go play in this space. I don't have to recreate the whole wheel. But again, I had that 20% chance that I could kind of go in there and play without reinventing the whole wheel. And, and that gave me the creative freedom I needed to do what I wanted to do, but, but it saved me a lot of time and a lot of energy. So you could argue the same thing in the Star Wars universe or whatever, right? Where you could go into that universe and the universes are big and they're vast and there may be time eras that, that, that are not fully fleshed out. There could be areas of a universe like a planet or a, a region or whatever that are not perfectly fleshed out and you can go take your story there and you have the rest of that story, that 70% that's, that's here that kind of tells you like, okay, I don't have to create all these new characters. I might have 70% of the characters either be from the same races that have already been established in the Star Wars universe but I can use them, you know, in this other part of this, of this other planet, just like Tatooine. When you go in there, you go in the bar scene. And then one of the greatest parts about that bar scene was that it, it showed that there was literally, you know, hundreds of different aliens in the universe, right? You didn't go to any of those planets, but you just knew how rich the universe was by that one bar scene really established, like, how big that universe was, right? So so you could bring in a bunch of those characters and bring those into that, that world that you're building and nobody's going to know any different, but you don't have to recreate that whole universe, right? 
So, so that's where when I talk about like a 70, 30 or 80, 20 kind of rule, like whether you are doing something new and original or not, you know, you can often do that. Now, if you were doing something that was say science fiction or fantasy, you could have that same thing again. Like you may not necessarily, you might have orcs and goblins and whatever, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have Sauron and the ring of power, you know, and, and those specific details that were, that are Lord of the Rings, right? You don't want to, you don't want to step on their IP. Like that's, that's what Lord of the Rings is. They have their characters. They have their exact precise storyline, but they're fantasy, right? So you have to understand like there's fantasy and then there's the Lord of the Rings, you know, and, and other, and the other hundred, you know, fantasy movies and, and games and things that have come out. So there's a difference of what is the IP? What is the genre of the franchise, you know, allow for? That's that 70%. And then everybody takes that little bit extra to make it their own, right? And that's what you want to do when you're trying to create that thing that's unique. So we talked a little bit about existing IPs already. But again, you just have to define and figure out what is in that IP and what you're gonna, you know, what you're gonna do with it, right? And and understand you know what um, um, what your box is, what your limitations are. And again, the IP could be Star Wars and it could just be fantasy, right? Or it could be 300 and historical, right? But again, it's historical-ish. And, and stuff. So, so you know, it's not perfectly historical. So you have to kind of understand what are your limits? Like, what are you going to use within that IP? What are you going to use within that his, history, the mythology, the whatever it is, it, you know, and what, what are you using there? Now, some of the things that you, you may or may not start with backstory and history. Um, the, um, Backstory and history is um, something that can be important, and again, can set that foundation for your universe. But but often, you know, what your present day is 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 the most important thing, and so you, you need to kind of be careful about whether you start here or not. And again, if you're starting from scratch, you know, I would say to not detail out a lot of backstory and history unless it's really, really, really critical to to the history of that character, to, the, to that kind of stuff, right? Like do do you need to know in your particular product what the history of the universe is? Or again, is it okay to have these little hooks, these little tentacles that sort of know like, okay, there's some, there's some historical stuff and there's some other things that are there. Um, <coughs> but what details do I need to know today? Right. And, and are those things historical? Are those things mytho mythological? And sometimes, also to be aware of, sometimes his, history and mythology kind of tend to intermix, especially like Chinese history. Um, the Chinese tend to have a lot of um, stuff where if you look at their wuxia, look at the Monkey King, and, and some of these um, things that we as Westerners would consider mythological, um, especially the stuff with the monks and like the, the monks that, you know, like look at Crouch and Tiger, Hidden Dragon, um, where I can do something and I can fly through the air or do something really supernatural we would consider that mythological because we don't think it's real. But to them, they actually think that that was real and that was historical to them. And they, they blur the lines between mythology and history. So be careful of that when you're, when you're establishing this thing to understand kind of what's histor historical, what's mytho mythological, and maybe what is each culture and each race and each group think is, is real, right? Like one group may think that dragons are mythological. And other groups like, hey, we raise dragons and I got one at home. Like, you know, and, you know, and so the perception in a world could be based on a particular character or group or, or their own experiences or, or where they live or, you know, all these things, right? So for you, you have to, you have to build those rules of the universe, right? Um, Cleegan, um, any books you recommend related to creating stories and worlds? That's a long list. Um, you know, there, there's a, uh, a pretty good book called World Building that I really like. Um, it's not a very big book. Um, I wish I could remember the, the author's name. There's a whole series of books, again, for writers um, that, that are pretty good. So if you go to Amazon or something and type in World Building, um, there's a lot of really good stuff there. Um, I'll try to, maybe before my next talk on World Building, I'll try to maybe put together some links of like some resources for you guys that I really like and go through my books and, and try to bring some of those together. Um, the other things for world building that I really, really, really like, and I talk about this in my ideation talk a few weeks ago, is the GURPS book series. Um, and I think pen and paper RPGs in general 
are a huge place that I get a lot of inspiration because I feel like the, the source books, they're, you know, 100, 200 pages. Um, they talk about an entire topic, you know, and they'll have books on magic and they'll have books on historical stuff and they'll have books on, you know, whatever it is, fantasy, and they break it all down really concisely and things like that. And so, so a lot of those give me a lot of inspiration when I'm trying to understand a particular subject or even just kind of brainstorming because a lot of this world building is just brainstorming, right? We're trying to figure out these ideas and we're trying to be like, okay, how do we take that to the next level? Like, or what, what would we want to do? So for example, I might have this idea as I'm starting to work out my idea, I might be doing say a science fiction game. And if you, uh, for those of you that are in my class, there's a, there's some examples of a game called Bounty Hunter I did. And Bounty Hunter was a sci-fi game, and I had the ability to put in bionics and, and artificial limbs, basically, that were robotic, right? But they're, they're things that looked human, but they would give you extra, extra ability, strength, stuff like that. Now, from a game design perspective, one of the things of why I like bionics is basically they're just stat changes. Like, if I want my character to be stronger and stronger and stronger... If the, if the stuff is under my skin and it's all part of my internal structure, I don't have to show it, you know, in my art necessarily. Like I could just have my character stats get better and better and better. And all I'm doing is changing a number somewhere. And I'm not having to like remodel my entire character necessarily and putting new arms on them. They're all like weird and robotic and, you know, things like that. So it, it was solving a problem and that it allowed me to modify my characters, um, without with a minimal amount of art changes and that's where i started with this idea of like how do i get more diversity in my characters um with the minimum with minimizing the amount of art required and so i came up with the idea of bionics well it just so happens that gurps has a whole series of uh or a whole book on bionics and and that whole thing and so like so i had that initial idea i, I remember that reference book i went to that book and started digging through it you know and um Lo and behold, it was like, it starts asking me all these hard questions, you know, because it is an RPG, right? And so they, so they do kind of cover some of the gameplay stuff. And so it started thinking about like, well, how do they get powered, you know, and, and like, how are they, what kind of materials are they, are they constructed out of? And like, how much do they cost? And like, and it just started asking kind of all these sort of questions that were both part of the, the world building, part of that thing, but they were also had gameplay relevance. And I was like, oh my God, like I hadn't thought about like half that stuff. And so it really inspired me because I was like, oh, that was that was great. Like I, I, I was getting gameplay ideas, but also getting world building ideas and, and things like that. So there, there's a lot of, you know, ideas can come from a lot of different um, um, things. Yeah, Megan, just like Kratos, you know, it's mythological. Um, yeah, I mean, Joseph, I mean, yes, the Monkey King is mythological, and that was, that's definitely one that crosses into, I would say, mythology. But I'd say a lot of the Wuxia stuff, like the Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon stuff, at least from when I, I lived in China, if you guys don't know, for six years. So I'm fairly knowledgeable of Chinese culture and, and Chinese history and stuff, having lived there, you know, for six years. Um, and like I said, that was what surprised me when I lived in China, was the fact that there was a lot of misconceptions about things like dragons, um, ghosts, um, and Wuxia type things and stuff like that, that when you actually talk to a lot of people, not, not necessarily everybody, but, but a lot of people, they, they had a lot of, oh, confusion is the right word, but you know, they, they definitely, um, would get a lot of that stuff kind of confused, you know, um, which I thought was very interesting. All right, let's see. Um, yeah, so I think that's for history and backstory is is covers a lot of the, the, the things. And again, these, these are huge, 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 huge rabbit holes you can go down. So be careful about how deep and how detailed you go in these things. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> sorry, Joseph, I, I speak some Mandarin, but I don't um, I don't read any Mandarin. So. That was one one of the things I I got decent at, t at speaking Mandarin, but never never learned to read it. So, um. Anyways, um. So technology. So the next thing to kind of think about in your, in your in your world building is technology. Now the question, you know, the the answer might be that there's, I mean, technology doesn't mean that it has to be metal. Technology does not mean that it has to be electronic. 
So if you look at, um, this was especially established in a lot of the GURPS and in D&D um, type stuff. Um, but the, um, the, the technology level could literally be like stone, you know, like caveman level technology, like stone axes and things like that, right? That would be, um, I don't remember what the full, I'm trying to remember now. I think they did tech levels one through 10 or one through 20. I'm trying to remember now. Anyways, so like if I remember correctly, I'm sorry, it's been a little while since I used technology levels, but they actually, and some of these things have actually established kind of these technology levels. And at the most basic primitive level, which I think was one, it would be like a stone ax, right? And the most, you know, simple, simple, simple kind of things. And if you advance that all the way to the far end of the scale would be like, the most advanced, like even, even a thousand, you know, years beyond Star Wars or Star Trek, like, you know, teleportation and, you know, and, um, all these like zero gravity drives and things like that. And so in these technology charts, there's basically all these advances that go from like, you know, bows and arrows to guns to, you know, the automobile, you know, to like kind of current day technology. If I remember right, I think we were like, maybe it is one through 20, and then it was like, we're at like tech level eight, I think, or something in our current world today. And then, you know, your Star Wars and your, and your Star Treks and things like that might have been like tech levels 11 or 12, you know. And then it was kind of like, but there was still even more advanced technology that might exist in certain books and things like that. And so, so again, technology levels could be kind of zero. So again, don't, don't, the word technology does not have to be, again, electronics and, and what we would identify necessarily as technology. But, but this idea of a tech level is something that I believe GURPS might have originated, but I, I could be wrong. I'm not sure where the original te tech levels came from, but I know that, that GURPS and some of those do define it and they define it very carefully about what each tech level has. But again, certain universes may, you know, maybe when the player or the, the character is experiencing it right now might be at a certain tech level. But again, some things may progress. So some of that might be that in history, you would have, you might have lower tech levels. You might have had a higher tech level. For example, the, the mythology of Atlantis um, in our current mythology actually points to a technology level that was much higher back if Atlantis was real, if we assume and made the assumption in our world, like the movie Aquaman or something, right? If we assume that Atlantis was real, then you know, that at some point in our history, there actually was a higher technology level than we currently have today. So don't, don't assume that technology levels ramp always smoothly, right? They could be, for various reasons, jumping back and forth from higher levels to lower levels. You know, we could, we could have an ancient, look at Cowboys versus Aliens, the movie, you know, we could have two disparately different technology levels because a group of aliens show up, you know, and they've got one technology level and we've got another, right? So, so there's lots of ways to mix and match technology levels, but you have to understand and build in your universe this idea of understanding what are these technology levels, how they interrelate, who has what, who has access to what and why and everything related to that. And again, these are the rules that we need to set. So if we change the, the misconception of the technology levels or the perception of the technology levels, we need to know why, right? So, so again, if our, if our game was taking place modern day today, you know, and, and it's supposed to be historical and real, and then suddenly, you know, I'm teleporting around and I'm, you know, regrowing my limbs when it gets cut off and I've got all this like super advanced technology, people are going to be like, what, how, where'd that come from? Like what, what happened there? Like, I don't get that. Right. Um, so, um, so you need to be aware of, again, there's a certain expectation of what technologies bring and how these things mix together. Right. And, and so, um, so Star Trek and Star Wars and things like that can sometimes intermix it because you might have an advanced technology level kind of aliens for all intents and purposes, I mean, the, the Star Trek Federation and Captain Kirk and them are aliens to other people, right? There could be another, we, I mean, it's an alien planet for us, right? But we could go to an alien planet that has a lower technology level. We're aliens to them, right? You know, so they're, we're aliens to each other, but they could have a super primitive technology level and, and, um, or they could have a perception of that 
you know, and then, you know, we could be doing, you know, think that we're much more powerful because we see our technology is better, but they could have something that's very different. Um, I actually have a favorite um, episode in Stargate SG-1. If you guys ever saw the TV series there, and there's one particular episode where, again, the Stargate people have mostly our modern day technology, but they, they discover the portals that take them to different planets. So that they do get a, a, a little bit of, um, they do get a little bit of some extra technology through some of the aliens, but it's, it's relatively the same, you know, of, of our modern day stuff, you know, machine guns and things like that. And they go to this one alien planet and there's these super, super, super primitive or their perception of these people that are there. And, and they get really worried because I think the, if I remember right, it's been a while, the bad guys are chasing them and they know the bad guys are going to come to that planet. And they're like, and they're really worried. They're trying to protect these people because they know the bad guys are going to come. And they're telling these people like, hide, hide, like go away. Like these bad guys are coming. You know, we can't protect you. You need to go like hide because you're, you're vulnerable because you're primitive. Right. And they were, they were trying to like do all the stuff to like save them. And then at the very end of the like the episode, um, I remember that the, the one alien kind of did this like hand wave thing and suddenly like all these big floating cities and all these things that were like crazy, big, powerful, whatever, suddenly like revealed themselves. And the whole point of that was is that it's that old saying of like any advanced technology, sufficiently advanced technology is perceived as fantasy or magical. Right. And there's that whole thing of like, here we were as kind of arrogant, you know, modern day human beings thinking we're trying to protect these people when in reality they were light years ahead of us and their technology levels. They just didn't show it, you know. And so we didn't understand their technology. We saw it as magic, but really it was an advanced technology. And so so that's something that you do have to sort of be aware of and how you're mixing and matching those kinds of things. So Keegan, the transition of, for example, a modern world setting into a sci-fi big city character should be produced by smooth transition, hence justifications based on the rules of the world. Usually, yes. But again, sometimes that can be done very abruptly in such a way. But, you, you know, so there's quite often stories where, you know, something happens. You step through a portal like Alice in Wonderland. You know, you go from a modern, uh, a normal everyday world suddenly into something just completely crazy and, and different. Now, the difference is, Alice now has to learn that new world um, and she has to learn those rules of it. But the, the but the, the part of where she steps into the story is not going to kill her and not going to like completely destroy her the first second she's there. Right. And so so that's the kind of thing where the, the, the smooth transition, even though it was an abrupt transition, she goes down the rabbit hole. Literally, um, it was an abrupt transition. But then then it smooths and ramps in from there and understanding and establishing the rules of that universe for us. Um afterwards and so so that's kind of how you can transition some of those things and have a shock factor to it and have the like oh my god where am i but then also being able to now re-establish the player in a new world and re-establish them in, in something new anyways um unfortunately we're out of time we actually only got through half the slides today so i guess next week we will continue um with this conversation um and keep talking about um world building I hope you found this useful and interesting and I'm not going down too many rabbit holes myself. But again, I'm trying to do my best to explain these things to you guys. So anyways, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Um, have a great week and be safe. And, you know, I really look forward to seeing you all next week. So take care and have a good one. Bye now.